everyone welcome back to the sports psych show thanks so much for joining me now today i'm honored to be speaking with amy price amy welcome to the sports psych show thanks dan thanks for having me really appreciate it why don't we start by getting you to introduce yourself to the sports psych show audience oh uh, yeah so um i guess historically coaching is my background um absolutely love um football and coaching football and been doing that for a number of years um however i guess in the last sort of 18 months i've dabbled a little bit more in coach development so i haven't necessarily gotten the grass as much as i would have liked to in the last 18 months um however it has opened up like a new a different way of looking at stuff from my perspective now as a coach developer um and it's got me probably a little bit more excited about the stuff we're going to speak about today in terms of you know uh how players think and how we can help players to think differently when they're playing football. Um, and then just sort of in between the football coaching and in between the coach development, I was I was in academia, so I was at St Mary's University. Um, started off on the PE, sort of sport education course, as a lecturer, and as a student before that, actually. And then sort of moved into the programme director role at the end. Um, did my master's and started off with a PhD. Well, it was a DPROF at the time. It's now a PhD. So that's kind of where all of this uh, stuff we're going to be speaking about today, that's where it sort of came from in the first instance. Um, and I've just been sort of studying it ever since. And just like, I guess I'm going to carry on studying it for a long time. because There's still so much that I haven't worked out in my own mind with all of this. Well, it's a lifetime of understanding or, or learning. And um, let's, let, let's sort of announce to the audience what all of this is. Um, we're going to run through one of your uh, papers that has just recently been published. Um, it's entitled Strategic Understandings, an Investigation of Professional Academy Youth Soccer Coaches' Interpretation, Knowledge and Application of Game Strategies. And you've published alongside some pretty big names, uh, Professor Dave Collins, Shane Pill and John Stovkowski. Am I getting that? Stokowski. Stokowski. So, look, why don't we begin at the beginning? Um, I got really excited when you uh, announced this on, on Twitter, and then when I read it, it was like, yes, love this. This is right up my alley, and I really want to talk to you about this. So we're going to go through this. Why don't you give us a bit of background, uh, Amy? Tell us a, a little bit about the study, and then how you came to studying this. Yeah, so I guess the, the prior studies are really important to highlight here. Um, this is sort of sort of third um, of a, hopefully of a series of five studies that are linked. So the two that, that came before were around video game design, to be honest. The first one was very much um, I'm looking into the uh, potential for learning and performance in how video games are designed and how that potential can be transferred onto the football pitch with players in terms of how we, how we coach. And... That was actually the initial sort of inspiration behind that came probably in 2012-13 time where I started off my master's and had a dissertation to write and um, I, I was very much into game-based approaches then, probably way too much uh, leaning towards that way of coaching and hence why I looked at video game design. Um, Shane Pill is another person out there who'd already looked at that as well um, at the same time as me and then we collaborated on that um, and that's kind of where it started and then sort of moving so that's that first paper that I was talking about the the first of potentially five papers okay. looks at principles of video game design then the one after that looks at well okay this is just one way of coaching um, if we were to say there is a video games approach to coaching of certain learning principles, that's that's brilliant, but that is just one way. So the second paper was looking at, well, what are the other ways to coach games? Um, we know that there's obviously loads of different ways, um, including some of this, the stuff that's been in the literature loads, such as teaching games for understanding, constraints-led approach, and 
more of a directed approach in terms of sort of isolated drills and stuff like that. So that was a kind of framing around, okay, what are the benefits of all these different approaches? Why would we use that one and not that one? And when would we blend them, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so this one here that you're talking about, Dan, this was more around, well, if we're saying that a video games approach to coaching is predominantly focused around this idea of deep understanding of the game and helping players to seriously understand the game. Um, and this, well, theoretically underpinned by this concept of metacognition. Well, this paper then sort of looked to break that down a little bit by hearing from the coaches themselves, by going, come on, like, let's talk to some coaches who are actively working with players day in, day out in a professional environment from, you know, like under eights all the way up to under 23s and hear from them in terms of, well, what is it? What is game understanding? What does it look like? How do you know? How do you coach for it? And yeah, kind of using that to inform future studies as well. So what I'm hearing you say there is this piece of research um, is exploring a coach's interpretations of game understanding. Correct, um, yeah. Can you unpack game understanding for us a little bit? What, what, what do you mean by game understanding? What is game understanding? Well, that's exactly what I asked the coaches. <laughs> <laughs> I think, personally, as a coach, um, in you know, over the years and stuff, I think it's a phrase that I personally probably used all the time okay. because that's something I was I was tended to be interested in when when I was working with players, and and even I don't think I ever really like defined it in my own head. To be honest with you, like. I never really sat down and goes like, what what kind of behaviours, what kind of um, what kind of stuff on the pitch, or what what would players be saying to me that would make me think, oh, you've got good a good game understanding. Um, and that's exactly why when we spoke to these coaches, you know, there was um, it was actually I think quite difficult for them in, at times to articulate what they really mean by it. But there obviously there was some some common trends that came out of those interviews um and there's some some probably elements that we can now hang our hat on a little bit with with what game understanding actually is i noticed as i as i read through the piece there was a, an emphasis on strategic understanding what do you mean by that yeah so um that's for me is where that metacognition piece comes in because something i'm um, that I would probably class and relate to that is this idea of when players are playing the game, how aware and in control are they of what and when they're thinking? So as I'm playing the game as a player, mm. am I thinking about my thoughts and am I finding a way of controlling what I'm thinking about so that my actions are really deliberate and for me that's a strategic understanding of the situation it's it goes beyond just an understanding you know it's not just understanding how to how to apply a solution to a problem it's not just a sort of just the cognitive it's the the bit beyond that so it's me having a cognitive strategy of you know how am I going to approach this problem? It's me like having a um, an awareness of the the task and how to alter the difficulty or ease of that task to my advantage. It's me knowing when to pay attention to myself as a learner, myself as a player, but also my teammates and of the opposition, and tapping into the, all of those different sources at the right time to get the best outcome that I can get in that situation that's interesting because i think that within the coaching community when we think about player development when we think about coaching i suppose our obvious entry points are firstly from a technical perspective and if we're talking soccer football today you know we're talking passing first touch dribbling shooting tackling etc etc and the technical underpinnings of those skills 
So that feels like an entry point there. I suppose another entr entrance point is from a tactical perspective. Um, and this might be sort of as players get a little bit older, um, understanding the tactics of the game, teaching the tactics, uh, the game models, if you like. But what I hear you say is that from a if we want players, part of this game understanding, if we want players to understand the game, we want them to have a strategic understanding. And that strategic understanding is that sort of anticipation, decision making. Um, when do I, you know, when uh, should I be aware of what I'm doing? Should I be aware of what I'm doing? How do I, how do I, um, adjust my decision making how do i make new decisions how can i be flexible with my decisions am i on the right track there yeah and i, I kind of um in in my own understanding of this and trying to work it out in my own head i looked i looked towards those ideas of types of knowledge and as a coach what type of knowledge do we promote with players um and why um so you know we have that declarative knowledge mm. which which is probably that like those situations where we help players to know about something we help them to know that for example playing through the thirds will help us to dominate possession will help us potentially to create more goal scoring opportunities so players can answer questions and they know that doing x does that potentially um then you have that kind of next layer around procedural mm -hmm which um, how I understand that is it's knowing how to do it. So players are on the pitch demonstrating that, doing it, you know, um, creating those angles, making those movements, playing those passes. And I think the next part of the knowledge base is that, that really interested me and really links this idea of strategic is conditional. Um, conditional knowledge where we help players to know the when and the why. Um, so when would I do that and not that and why? Um, and there's a really good example, and I always draw upon this because I, I just think it's, it's a really clever one, is uh, Sky Sports, Jamie Carragher, having an argument with Gary Neville, talking about Arsenal, um, playing out from the back. Uh, the, the point was that Arsenal weren't very successful. They kept losing the ball. And Gary Neville was saying, you know, it doesn't matter if they keep losing the ball. It's what the manager believes in. It's what they've what they've learnt to do. They're trying to do that. Um, we have they have to carry on doing it, and that's just the way it is, you know. And <laughs> Jamie Carragher was saying, well, that's ridiculous because these are top level players. We're not asking them to necessarily completely change and boot it long, but surely they're able to realize that it's not working and surely the manager would encourage this idea of tweaking it of maybe just slightly tweaking the position at the start position of players or tweaking the, the the pattern of when the ball goes to the center backs and when it goes to the center midfielder for example and uh, to get to get the outcomes they need and I thought you know what that's what it is it's it's players being able to to tweak in the game players being able to, to look at it and go you know what is this working? Is it working? And now, why isn't it working? And if it's not working, um, how will I approach this problem next time I'm faced with it? So will I, will I look to, to change the outcome and try something different? Or is it my process? Maybe I need to aim for the same outcome but just change my problem-solving process. You know, so... For me, that's that was the key. It's like knowing when and why, and how how do we help players to to, to learn their when and why? Making decisions on the run, adapting on the run. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see why coaches might find that either difficult to define or difficult to know how to coach, because I wonder if historically what we've said is. I wonder if historically this has come under a game intelligence definition. That player's really intelligent. How come? What's what's he or she doing? Oh, they're just really intelligent. 
and and that's the, it's kind of been circular in as much as well they're just really intelligent how come well they just are they're just born with it that kind of feels that historically that's that's where that has lain essentially within the coaching circles yeah i think i'm definitely guilty of being being in that coaching circle and not necessarily being able to articulate what i mean by stuff like i feel like now i'd love to go back into coaching now to be honest and actually see um see if this understanding that i have now um i can actually put into practice on the pitch with players um because i think that's that's the key to it isn't it it's coaches will have lots of different methods to promote game understanding and and to support players with their decision making um for me the emphasis as i'm learning this the emphasis is actually more on the process so i'm interested in the problem solving process and not necessarily the action or intention of the player um cuz maybe as coaches we focus on the action or we might say ah oh, i can see what you was trying to do there i can see your intention um or what was your intention in that moment i couldn't quite see what you were trying to do but nonetheless we're still focusing our attention on the end uh result so i'd be more interested as a coach now to be looking at the process so what were you thinking there talk me through your thought process talk me through how you were tended on tackling that problem you know was and this is where the emphasis um on cognition comes in to start with coaching for cognition coaching for problem solving and helping players with that as a start point um because you can't think on a metacognitive level until you've you've done okay in the cognitive uh stuff let's back up a little bit there because i think what you've just said is really really important uh cognitive metacognitive what do you mean by cognitive what do you mean by metacognitive So I would say that cognitive is about solving a problem to make progress. Um, so football-wise, we're trying to find trying to find a way of getting out from the back um, so that we can progress up the pitch. And and I would say metacognitive is being able to monitor that. So yes, we are trying to solve a problem. um yes so that we can make progress um but the key is with an eye on the monitoring of the effectiveness of that and it's that reflection piece i suppose that you said earlier on so if you could if you could climb into a time machine if there was such a thing and go back go back coaching um or if you just had the opportunity tomorrow to coach what would look different what would you specifically be doing differently in order to help players develop these skills i think first of all i would be much more appreciative of the fact there's lots of different ways of doing stuff i think i was blinded by games game based before i think now if i was to go back into coaching i'd be a little bit braver and i would try different approaches um including isolated practice um i really but i think it's definitely stemmed from this coach development role where i can see the benefits of lots of different approaches and knowing when to use each one um if i wanted to really focus on strategic understanding of my players i would probably look to um help them with cognition first so i would be looking deeply into what processes they use to solve problems is it copying is it organization of information is it mental note taking is it stuff like that that's is that what they're consciously doing is that what they're trying to do when they when they're faced with a problem or or are they not thinking anything so i think the off field if that's if that's what you want to call it off field coaching or you know the the stuff that you might do um in terms of questioning players having conversations with players tasks that aren't necessarily on the football pitch to start with would um be something I'd probably place a lot more value on 
to try and get inside their head and make their thinking more overt. Um, and then I'd probably be looking at, okay, that's great. Like for those players that probably like, that have quite a, a range of cognitive processes, can we try and make them more me- metacognitive so that they can use their when and why information that we spoke about before so they can tweak, so that they can reflect and change and, and flex and monitor whether what they've tried to do has worked, whether the process worked for them. So again, that will come, for me, will come back down to conversations with players, slowing down training, even when we're on the pitch, slowing down coaching, slowing down playing. It's okay not to be high tempo all the time. It's like it's it's okay, you know, if you've apportioned a certain amount of your training time to be a little more, a little bit more slow. And by slow, I don't mean the coach talks the whole time and everyone's standing still. By slow, I mean like now nah, time for players to think. Um, and obviously, as a coach, there's multiple multiple ways in which you might uh, help to make that happen. Um, whether that's through your practice design, through your the way you interact with players. Um, we can be as creative as we want with that. Interesting. So, so what I hear you say there is that you take more of an eclectic approach to your coaching. That perhaps historically you've been oriented towards games, but now you see that as a slight limitation. That um, if we're if we're talking about the opposite of games could be isolated practice, you'd actually introduce that. Um, what I hear you say is, when it comes to that, to the strategic understanding, you'd engage in conversations with players around the cognitive side of things. You know, what are you doing? What are you thinking? What are you looking at to make the decisions that you're making? Um, and then you might engage them in more metacognitive stuff. So slowing things down and getting them thinking about their thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with that cognitive piece, um, we know that teaching games for understanding, for example, is a really, like, that, that approach has probably been designed with those intentions in mind to really zoom in on understanding and cognition and um uh, problem solving processes so that's just an example of you know what like there's a model there like what parts of that model might I use um, and then and it probably just goes back to my journey as a coach and as a coach developer and realising oh yeah there's actually a purpose behind all of these different ways of coaching um, and something where I'm at the moment as well is when engaging in that metacognitive piece that doesn't have to be um, in a game-based situation, I'm wondering now, as 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 I'm learning all of this, I'm wondering how how we could promote metacognition and strategic thinking, the the when and the why, with, whether that could come out in isolated practice as well. You know, so um, okay, there isn't an opponent necessarily, but there's still ample opportunity to get players to be aware and in control of their thoughts. That's interesting. So if it was just a basic sort of linear passing activity, you might utilise that not just for players to get better with their passing, their passing technique. You're not just stripping back the information around a player to help them develop their the technical side. You also might help them consider, you might strip back information in order for them to think about the information that is there and what that might mean to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm imagining myself in a passing pattern and I'm thinking, well, traditionally, yes, I'm going to be in those situations um, to know, to be taught or to be coached and to understand why this is what it is like in terms of we're passing here, we're moving here, and know the benefits of that. But I'm also going to be doing it, so I'm going to be learning how to actually apply it. Okay, there's no opposition, but I've still got to I've still got to understand the timing of my movement in relation to the player who's passing me the ball, for example, or how to strike the ball in a certain way to get the right 
weight on the pass. So I'm still practicing that. But I'm thinking, let's, I'm sure we can go up another notch there and and, and get players to um, to be actively reflecting on and thinking about um, other stuff. So as a player in that moment, can I be thinking about myself as a learner? You know, like... What am I like in these situations? Do I lack concentration sometimes? Am I aware that I lack concentration sometimes? And if I do, what am I going to be doing in this situation t- to keep me engaged and concentrated? Um, and also, like, if if there's, like, a situation um, whereby um, the task itself, for example, can I, am I aware or am I able to alter the the difficulty of that task to my advantage so if I know that a certain way of receiving the ball or a certain pass is not is not my forte for example what will I be doing to to uh, make it um, a strength not a strength of mine but what will be what will I be doing to uh, to make sure my weakness isn't so obvious and you know whether that be something related to the the detail of of the of my receivings my movement before I receive the ball so there's ways we can really help players to be strategic in whatever situation they're faced with um and, and I just I, I I think for that to happen I think there has to be support from the coach I think we need to really try to get to get inside the head of players um, and that slowing stuff down is for me is, is is vital. I love what you said there. I love what you said there in general, but I love what you said in terms of players reflecting on what's going on. For me, I just wrote down the word experience. What what am I experiencing right right now? And I I, I wonder if young players do that enough if they're as they're doing this passing activity and hey look even if they're just kicking a ball up against the wall right if we were to really strip things back what am i experiencing right now as as you said when am i getting bored what's making me bored is and then acting on that or becoming strategic what is it that i can do to turn down the volume of boring and turn up the volume of interest um so making an adjustment um and as you mentioned there it almost feels like another word i wrote down there was autonomy you can almost you you could venture down this path of being an autonomy supportive coach by asking them those questions about what they're experiencing in the moment what are you thinking here what are you feeling what are you what are you focused on yeah and and i would just add to that around Let's say I am that player kicking the ball against the wall and I might have set myself a challenge. I might have said, right, I need to be able to do this 50 times in a row. I did that. Like, I'm sure as kids growing up, we all we all sort of um, practice tricks and flicks and different stuff in the garden. And I'm just thinking like, if, for example, I make a mistake and it all goes wrong or I can't do it, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm really finding this difficult. As a player in that situation... Um, am I thinking about my process? Am I, like, so for me, copying people in terms of skills was a way that I would learn a skill. So I would look at a video of someone and I would try and copy it or I'd see someone do it and I'd go, right, I'm going to try and do that. So I'm copying it. But at some stage, copying might not be the process that works. So... When when I'm kicking the ball against that wall and I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it. I'm failing. When do I change my problem solving process? When do I move away from copying um, and move on to something else, a different process that might help me to achieve the 50, 50 uh, passes against the wall successfully? How in your own mind? My brain's churning away here because I agree with you and I love it. And I think that what you're what you're talking about, what we're talking about, is an invisible mediator of 
success for want of a better term okay it's an invisible or progress progress is it it's a it, it's a silent or it's an invisible mediator of progress um i'm a believer that very young players when they catch on to something when there's an inner shift they have a realization and possibly they can't always articulate that realization um about a process and then they start to improve i think that's a big mediator of progress um so i love what you're saying i'd like to get your comment on what i've just said there i don't know if you feel the same way but also i'd like to get your comment on i know a lot of coaches might be listening in and going awesome amy but hey wow is that still going to be fun if we're talking about kids is that still enjoyable how do you accommodate that fun and enjoyable aspect to that metacognition aspect? Do you feel it goes hand in hand? Do you think they're separate? What, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on both of those comments? So I'd say a mediator of progress is um, probably a really cool way to put it. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like there's no need for a coach in some instances. I'm not saying there isn't a need for a coach, but I'm saying in some ways the player themselves is their own teacher. Um, if they've sort of got decent metacognitive um, understanding, strategic understanding. And a coach can facilitate, sorry, Amy, but a co- coach can facilitate that, can't they? I mean, that in, the, in the sessions, and, and that can help a player improve their capacity to do, to do that. Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm that kid kicking the ball against the wall, with, you know, in that informal context, I am my own teacher if, if I'm thinking on that level. But, of course, when I go into my training environment, the coach is hopefully the person that encourages me to, to develop those metacognitive game skills is what I call them. So um, there's three skills which are planning ahead. So as a player, am I, am, I, am I okay with being conscious and deliberate with my next move? How much, how much is planned for and how much is kind of just not thinking or off the cuff or instinctive? Um, but then, then the next one is um, is being able to set problems. So, how good am I at making it hard for the other team or for the, my direct opponent? Mm. And the last one is information gathering. So, can I do I know the information that I need to find out, and can I set out to find it? And it's been very conscious, deliberate, aware of like, okay, I need to find out if I'm quicker than you here. I need to actually test you a little bit. I need to run in behind, see if you can catch up with me. You know, like it's consciously going out and finding out some stuff to use to my advantage so that I can set problems, so that I can plan ahead. Um, Now, those skills, I believe all three of them skills, yes, they suit a game-based situation, but I think they can also suit a non-game-based situation um, because planning ahead, absolutely, you can do that without an opponent. Um, can I set problems without an opponent? Yeah, for myself um, because I want to learn and I want to progress. Um, can I find out some information that I need to find out in order for me to make progress? Yeah, definitely. Um, about the environment, for example, or about the surface that I'm playing on, about myself um, as a player. So, yeah, they're the skills. And I would say that 100% a coach would be potentially trying to facilitate those metacognitive game skills um, in how we work with players. And in relation to your question around fun and engagement, it is, in my opinion, I, I mean, this is all stemmed from video game design. Um, would we agree that video playing video games is fun and engaging? 100%. I, pr- I think we all would. Um, and we probably also agree that video games are very good at helping us to to not just make progress in the game, but to be able to monitor our progress as we make it in the game. So fun and engagement is fun to progress. It's fun to get better at something. Um it's fun to to be the person that's um, that's leading the way with that. You know, it's fun to be my own, the person that's actually monitoring my 
our progress, not just the coach all the time telling us or intervening or guiding or um, influencing how we think about that. So, yeah, fun and engagement. Um, I think that would probably lead us lead us nicely onto the the actual um, video games approach, which aims to develop strategic understanding. And those that approach itself is is based upon five design principles. So, you know, having missions, having superpowers, having level ups, having uh, pauses. That, that's all stuff that promotes strategic understanding. Um, and from sort of anecdotal feedback from players that I've worked with and, and other coaches who've tried it out with their players, it seems to it seems to captivate players in the sense of that they're engaged in the process. Um, and I, I don't know why that is because it's not necessarily the angle I've taken with the whole thing. It, it's not just to engage and to, to make stuff fun, but it seems to happen as a result of, of focusing on the strategic understanding piece. So correct me if I'm wrong here. If you take those three thinking patterns, planning ahead, setting problems, information gathering, what you're saying is we want players to improve their capacity to, to do those things. And that absolutely resonates with me and I think it would resonate with everybody. But in addition, what you're saying is, well, here's a fun way to do it through a games design uh, a computer games design approach you talk about missions super powers which we, we can run through these leveling up pauses I think there's a fifth but I didn't catch it saving progress saving progress okay so rather than if we think of planning ahead setting problems in information gathering rather than it just being I don't know, from a very general basic perspective, right, we're going to think about planning ahead today and, and basing questions as a coach around those, uh, around that, planning ahead. It's actually bringing in sort of a computer games approach to be able to enhance a young person's capacity to plan ahead. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and those, the choice of principles are completely based around the idea of developing metacognition and strategic understanding. They were never designed to make it fun, but it just happened to be fun in the end. But I suppose, I mean, if I take those five ideas, take missions, which that that's one of the principles that to me is like, okay, I get that. that you know, we, we set a, a mission here. Um, rather than a challenge, it's, it's a mission. Um, I suppose a coach is going to going to be there as a guide in order to help a player comp or set of players complete a, complete a mission um, and encompassing that mission is the capacity to plan ahead yeah yeah 100 percent. now i think in terms of missions it, it's probably the, the trickiest design principle out of the five i would say from a coaching perspective and how to actually come up with a mission um because it's the opposite of what we might have been coached before as coaches. So the mission is not to promote technical and tactical information or knowledge. So it's not about promoting declarative knowledge of passing or combination play or dribbling. It's not about that. It's, it's, and it's not about promoting the procedural knowledge of a certain skill or technique. It's... We need to focus on the bigger picture, the wider goal of a game. Um, and it's up to the players to decide on what skills they will use. But those skills are strategies. And that's what video game design does well. It's, you know what you've got to do, but along that journey, you're going to try out a different skill as your strategy of getting there. And that changes all the time based upon the feedback you get from the game. Can you give me an example of, you know, when you were coaching, uh, a mission you might set set players that enhance their planning ahead or... Yeah, so um, I did this game, I did it for a long time with a group of players where 
got your football pitch, it's, a, it's just a game, so say it's a 5v5. Five five. I just basically divided the pitch into three um, vertical channels. Uh, started off with players locked in channels. I'm sure as coaches we've done that lots of times. But the purpose for me behind that was your mission is to unlock all of your team from these channels. And that's completely up to them, as I say, how they go about doing that. But they have to be thoughtful and well-planned in terms of what skills they'll use as strategies to find a way of unlocking. And all we did was, like, every, say, eight or ten minutes, we brought, we brought everyone in. Okay, who's winning the game? Or who's got the best goal difference? Or whatever it is. Okay, this team have brilliant. You get a player unlocked now. Um, straight away, they've levelled up. Straight away, now, they're in a situation where they've, they're playing the same game against the other team. But, but they're on level one and the other team aren't. Um, they've got a more complex task because someone's unlocked, so they've got more decisions to make. Um, a greater emphasis on being well planned because somebody in their team is now able to go anywhere on the pitch. Um, so that's just a sort of a basic example of how metacognitive game skills can come out of how we, how we utilise missions, level ups, um, the benefit of level ups, progress is really obvious, you know, so in a, in a video game it's very obvious when you're, when you're uh, doing well and when you're not doing well and sometimes in um, invasion games it's quite hard to know whether you're doing well um, because it can be quite chaotic and, you know, as an individual, as a team, you, unless you just look at the scoreline, um, and even the scoreline doesn't necessarily suggest whether you're doing well or not. Um, so yeah, it's just it's it's just a different way, I guess, of trying to take the emphasis away from technical and tactical information, declarative and procedural, and maybe focusing more on the conditional knowledge base of players. The problem solving. Uh, well, not just that, but the being able to monitor my my problem solving process just returning to the um, to the paper can you give us some outcomes of that paper I know you interviewed a bunch of coaches what did you learn from the interviews so I guess the first thing that stood out was game understanding was really highly valued from coaches at every level under eights all the way up to sort of under 23s um and that's across like a, about seven i think it was seven different academies and the other thing that stood out was coaches from different academies and from coaches within the same academy didn't have like a shared understanding of game understanding so their views differed quite a lot in terms of what it actually looked like on the pitch with players and also in terms of how they would coach it or how they currently coach it, coach for it. So that's just quite interesting in itself, um, especially from those within the same academy. And that, that kind of stood out as, OK, like it's definitely maybe an area we could continue to, to delve into in terms, of, in terms of what it looks like and how we do it. The other thing that, that came out was um, this idea of strategic understanding it's not really a common term, common common thing in football. Um, strategy probably is um, for coaches, which which they which is often um, associated with our strategy for today's game. Um, what's our game plan? What's or what's our plan A and plan B? But not necessarily um, so not necessarily being strategic in how we how we play. So it's that having a strategy or thinking strategically and, and just differentiating between them. One's more of a fixed phenomenon, isn't it? One's more, this is our game model. And the other one is, this is how I'm going to deal with the challenges that are thrown at me as an individual. Yeah. And I went into these interviews with a bit of, I was aware of my bias, but I knew that I was thinking at the time, um, playing style, 
style and the academy seem to be the strategy um, because that's our style and that's how we play. So we will high press because that's how we want to play football here. That's how we do all the way through the age groups. So I'm thinking, okay, so style seems to be the strategy. Um, is that holding players back? Is that meaning that they're not necessarily able to practice that when and why and being able to tweak um, and sometimes not to high press and sometimes too high press? And was that was that taking away? Um, the opportunity for players to think strategically um, but then since then I've kind of gone on this full circle with where I'm at in thinking and I realise now that um, and I might change again but I realise now that having a style as a strategy if, if, if that's what it is in youth football um, I realise the importance of that because it's that game model piece potentially that you've just spoken about that clarity in how we are trying to play here you know like that common uh, that that opportunity for players to be able to work cohesively because that's how we play football um, as a guide for decision making and within that guide which is your style for example or your game model within that guide um, you've probably got um, players who are strategic in their thinking and players who aren't. So the strategic understanders of the game might be operating on the outer edge of their style. So if you drew a circle and wrote style in the middle, or game model, I know game model is a part of the style, put that in the middle, where are your players who are strategic in their thinking? They're probably on the outer edge of that circle, pushing the boundaries, trying to really stretch it. But they're still within the style because that's important because we're a team and we need to be able to work cohesively. Um, but maybe the ones who aren't as deep in their understanding of the game are sort of smack bang in the middle of that circle like because that's where they're at in their thinking. They're maybe much more uh, literal with this is what we do, this is what we always do, and this is what I'm going to carry on doing no matter what. Does that make sense? So having a style enables you as a, as a cultural group of coaches, as a club, to identify your strategic thinkers uh, and your, your players who perhaps lack that capacity to think strategically. It uh, would that, would that be a correct statement? I feel like that. That's what I feel like at the moment. Yeah, I think having that helps. It's also a great development. I mean, it's obviously a great development tool because clubs utilise styles or game models, but it's also a great development tool because. If we're talking about, and your investigation was with elite academies, if we're talking about young players who may go on and push on to professional careers, or you know, even just I don't know, play university football, adult, you know, good standard adult soccer, or go through the American system, the college system in the States, um, then having a style at academy level, if they've experienced learning that style, that's a great experience for them and that enables them to that enables them I suppose if they're strategic thinkers that enables them to adapt but if they don't experience that style then they don't experience a style they haven't experienced a way of doing things they haven't experienced a process yeah and I think um, going back to that idea of cognition and being able to solve a problem in order to make progress and what process do we use to solve that problem, e.g. rehearsal, organisation, elaboration and all of the stuff that falls within that. Like, that's in order to... Like, I, I need to know what we're aiming for. If you want me to solve a problem to come up with an appropriate solution, well, I kind of need to know what, what, the, what the objective is here. Um, and that's where the style becomes really important um, because otherwise my, the solution I come up with could just be 
completely random and off, off not actually helping us to make progress. Um, so I need to, that style provides me with a guide in terms of the appropriateness of my solution. Um, and therefore, when I'm looking to, to be more metacognitive, when I monitor and I review, well, and I tweak, has that worked? Do I need to l seek a different solution or do I need to approach it with a different process to get to that intended solution? I, um, I'm still using this guide of planes, though. Like I'm, it's, it's what I'm aiming for. Um, if we don't have something that we're aiming for, then what are we aiming for? <laughs> like, is it, it's just quite random. So it's hard to make progress then, isn't it? You know? there's, there's no organisation at all. Yeah. And we want organisation. What we, what I hear you say is we just want to develop players who are able to strategize, potentially adapt, but strategize and adapt towards something, towards that sense of organisation, towards that style. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I'm taking time to 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 think things through because I just think mm -hmm. it's a, I think it's a really interesting area. What what when you talk to coaches about this, what pushback do you get? Um, I think initially I think there's a there's an assumption that video games are for kids. So why would we why would we be looking at the way video games are designed? Maybe because they're for kids, and it's like. Nah, they're for adults. Like, adults love playing games too and love the way in which they're designed. And, you know, whether you're a kid or an adult, it's it's uh, promoting learning for whoever we are. Um, and also, I suppose it's that element of... So three things. The next thing is, why would we want people to think metacognitively? Why would we want players to think about their thinking? Is actually sometimes a question that is asked. And my response is kind of, um, why would you not? Why would you not? Why would you not want players who, who are still a team player, who are still aiming for the goals that we have in this team, but able to, to know when and why to tweak? Um, because I don't want them to overthink. Yes. Yeah. That's that's been something that's definitely. Um, been commented on you know if we overthink if players are encouraged to overthink would that mean their execution is not um not as good as it could be if, you know like would they make more mistakes what's your thoughts on that um i think isn't mistakes a way of being better improving is it an opportunity to improve if we're not stretching and trying to do trying to get ourselves out of that comfort zone or trying to do something to better ourselves, then will we ever get better? Um, you know, I, I think in football, I think in a 90-minute game, for example, you might not be able to think metacognitively in every single moment of that game. Um, probably going to be times when you can and times when you might not be doing that as much as well. I wonder if, if it's the difference between, say, higher cognition and lower cognition, that we always want to think the game in as much as we want to look, we want to see, we want to scan, and over time, how we respond to what we see from that scanning becomes lower cognition, so quite quick responding. But this notion that we don't want a higher cognition, that we don't want to build the capacity to assess the game, as you're describing, reflect, to think about what's going on in the game and to be able to problem solve, is just a myth because the fluidity of the game is the challenge of the game. The changing of time and space, you know, space emerging and then dissolving, time increasing and decreasing, players moving, the chaos of the game requires players to have to problem solve even within the most ordered and structured game model. I just think it's, 
if we're talking about football, and I suppose the same could be said for basketball, I'd guess, it's the most wonderful combination between lower and upper cognition. Yes, we probably want more of the lower. Yes, we probably want more of look and do. I get that. But we have to think the game. And, and I think historically, you know, we're English. Um, I think in Britain, UK, we haven't had enough players coming through that have experienced environments where they where the demands are to think the game to problem solve it's just this robotic i'll just go and do it and then we get so scared i'll just clear your mind and go and do it well no because what does the game demand it demands decision making on the run it demands problem solving and you must have to think about what you're doing when you're doing it yeah, I think you've articulated that a lot, a lot better than I probably could have. And as you were speaking, I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, if I'm thinking metacognitively and, yeah, okay, I might not be getting the desired outcome because maybe, you know, like I've got, I am over, maybe I am thinking a lot and it's actually impacting upon my final action. Like, isn't that just isn't that just a a process that's important to go through so that in the future you can make more quick more efficient metacognitive uh, thought processes and then actions so like where you talk about where players might be instinctive as we say isn't that because at some stage they've gone through quite a rigorous slowed down process maybe where they really are thinking about how to do this um and then it looks like it's instinctive but at some stage they've learnt it yeah uh, i think so i i think whether it's whether it's that players have had the opportunity to go through that slowed down process as in they've been given the opportunity by their coaches, or whether it's that at some stage a young person has decided that they're not just going to go onto the training pitch and just train, and train with 100% intensity, which tends to be the vernacular, the definition of great training in football. I've experienced over the last 15 years working at all levels is, hey, look at me, I'm training really hard. Look, I'm 100%. It's all about 100%. Well, stop. Hold on. Is it? Let, let's intellectualize that a bit. So what I'm saying there is, number one, is the coach pride providing that environment? If not, is the young player or player going out onto the pitch and choosing to engage in metacognition they wouldn't necessarily use that term, but think about their thinking. And I think I just wonder, as we mentioned earlier, is that a bit of a passport to progress? Um, and, sorry, that's where I wanted to go with that. A third one is actually are some of these young players who progress quicker, are they doing more off-pitch thinking consideration assessment and it's interesting you know I, I, I'm thinking about and I obviously can't name names I'm thinking about two players I've worked with a decade ago one was a striker one was a defender in the same team and the defender said to me I love it when this striker plays because they used to give each other a lift home in their car and they used to talk a lot about each other's plays play and what they used to see on the pitch, um, you know, it, 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 which I think is great. And that defender said to me, I love it when this striker plays because I know exactly what he's thinking when I'm on the ball. And I know exactly what he's thinking when the fullback's are on the ball. And I know, um, I know where if it comes back to him, I, I know what that striker wants me to do. I know uh, when to play a ball over the top to that to that player. And that stems from them talking a lot. But it could be just talking to yourself about it. It could be just you thinking about it. So it's almost, for me, three things here. 
sorry to go off on one, but <laughs> it's like number one, it's is a coach introducing it. And that's obviously the mainstay of what we've spoken about today. Number two is, is the player. I mean, Gia Jordet, the Norwegian sports psych, has just come out. And, you know, I think a recent article I read, and he's the scanning guy, right? The, the, the Arguably the world's leading expert in scanning, visual exploratory behaviours, as, as you call it. And he says, there's, I read that article, and he said in this article, there's just something, some young player makes a decision to do more scanning, gets it. Just something shifts in their brain about why that's important and bang, they're doing it. And then there's the story about Frank Lampard and his father on the side of the pitch shouting out pictures, pictures, pictures. So there's just either somebody comes along or the co- the player works it out themselves on the pitch and engages in, say, deliberate practice around this notion of metacognition and cognition and or that player is just really thinking about their thinking, thinking about the game and thinking about strategizing off of the pitch. So there's an essay for you there. Unpack <laughs> that one. <laughs> What's your I really there? agree with the um, the off pitch point. Um, I feel like it's definitely becoming more prominent, isn't it, within coaching? Um, and it's I just think it's an area to exploit in terms of making thinking more obvious and encouraging players to do it but to see the value of um thinking about their thinking and cognition etc um just to finish the question off you said um what resistance there's just there's just another thing in terms of coaches potentially resisting in the sense of um, this is more on the pitch in terms of the video game design principles as one way of promoting metacognitive game skills um, is the idea that maybe um, sometimes it's not 100% realistic to the game itself. Um, that's particularly directed at the idea of a superpower. Um, and I think, yeah, I guess it's because historically you mentioned it, I mentioned it about intensity. That's really important in training, as is realism, as is completely replicating and representing the game um, as much as possible, whether that's isolated practice or um, opposed practice, because I think you can represent the game in both of those. Um, and yeah, in superpowers, it's not about that. It's it's about opening up um a new way of looking at the game which players wouldn't have seen otherwise um, with the exact intention of helping them to find information that's needed um, to make progress, information gathering, with the exact intention of um, planning ahead, with the exact intention of setting problems. So, like, you know, when my friend, he, he came up with this superpower, he said, oh, what about an invisibility cloak and like being able to run offside brilliant yeah but that doesn't happen in a game it's not supposed to that's that, that's not what we're trying to replicate we're trying to we're trying to promote thinking about thinking um and cognition so actually by by having an opportunity to earn a invisibility cloak um the game is now presenting presenting me with different problems um and helping me to to do all that stuff we've just spoken about so for me it's yeah i guess to summarize potential resistance from coaches is overthinking potentially not always looking like the game itself on the training pitch um but on the flip side i'd say a lot of coaches have also like really engaged and like bought into bought into it and to be fair like now i said at the start i'm not coaching anymore unfortunately but I'm definitely relying on all those coaches out there to uh to help me to make further sense of all of this and and come up with some some ideas related to it as well I've just got one more question uh if I may um you you mentioned there that you believe that isolated practice or isolated training um can be representative of the game obviously this is a massive debate between various factions at the moment um what do you mean by that amy um because i'm th- i'm thinking of a, a full game 11 versus an 11 and then i'm thinking of a, an isolated training drill um which isn't the same as 11 v 11 so so 
can you articulate what you mean by it, it can still replicate the game? I guess I kind of have learned this in this role as a coach developer, getting to see coaches work and their different methods. And it's quite common that I might see in a senior team environment a um, isolated, say, a pattern that's been set up. Um, and the distances, the um, the actual patterns in terms of who gets the ball when, the types of movements they they sh- they show to get on the ball, um, the types of movements they show after they've released the ball, um, the pitch geography in terms of where the, the practice is set up on the pitch, like can really be representative of of a situation if designed effectively. You know, I think that's the skill is is for the coach to to know what they're trying to get out of it and um, to know their style or their model or like whatever it is, how they want to play. Um, so that's why I think it can be representative despite whether there's an opponent or not. Um, and sometimes, you know, like an, in a opposed situation, we assume that's representative. But actually, is it? Sometimes it's it's not always Um because it depends on the application of the players and the understanding of the players to be able to um, to attack and defend in a way that would happen in a game. Um, you know, because if I'm playing, if I'm in an if I'm in an opposed situation against your team, but your team are all over the shot, there's absolutely no organisation whatsoever. Um, then actually, for me, it's not that representative as a player and and for my team because. You're not playing the game as I would expect to play it against a team who are, lab- who are maybe a little bit more organised. And that's, that's particularly important from a defending perspective as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I think, I mean, I'm not a football coach, but I've I, I've been blessed with the opportunity to talk with so many um, uh, adult elite players. And uh, often, I, I mean, I come back to context matters, I think, and I think player feedback matters. Because my experience has been when I've asked players about isolated and then game based and this, that and the other and, and it's always been the same is they like a mix of things by and large. They can tell you what works, what doesn't work for them as individuals and coaches can't keep everybody happy all of the time. But having some sort of two way communication, you know, I, I remember a player last season saying to me, um, yeah, I love an overload activity because he was a central defender and he said I've you know I've really really got to turn up the volume of concentration and it created a lovely actual conversation around mental skills as a consequence I love overload um, but then the same player also said no I, very basic thing he said I love it when the coach takes me away and we just do some do some headers um, and you know we just uh, as I said a very basic thing there but just we just he just throws up a few balls we, I do some headers then he brings in a defender and I do that and you know it just gives me the feel of some time of ch- timing and then bring in another a defender and then I you know I've got a bit of competition and then I remember speaking to a player about um, utilizing a ball crossing machine um, and I think some people might say, well, you haven't got a lot of information about, you know, where that ball's coming from, you know, that you might have when you're playing a real game of football. But, uh, the, you know, the player said to me, we don't mind with the ball crossing machine. We're just working on our technique. We're just working on the feel of, you know, the ball comes across and then we'll volley it or half volley it or head it. And that's that's what we're happy focusing on there. You know, Dan, we don't mind that. That's quite good. So I think it's... It's an interesting dynamic. I think it's just about the coach being clear on the objective. You know, like if it's if it's just getting a feel for the ball in that instance of clearing it and reading it, like it just depends on what you're trying to work on. And um, some drills, I guess, will be not so representative, and maybe that's deliberate. Um, and some and some drills, some some unopposed stuff like those patterns I was describing will be highly representative, and maybe that's that's deliberate in terms of helping them to understand um, some of the pictures as you described it. And um, yeah, I just think that's probably open to debate, isn't it? It's quite an interesting, an interesting yeah. subject, probably for another time. But um, yeah, <laughs> so much to talk about in, in all of this. Indeed. Well, look. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I know you would have tapped the interest of the, the audience. How can people get in, in contact with you? 
Yeah, Twitter's probably the, the best way, so it's Amy Price underscore 10. Perfect. Brilliant. Amy, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Good chat. I liked it. I enjoyed it too. Well, everyone, wasn't that brilliant? Um, I really enjoyed that conversation, that podcast, and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the Sports Site show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.